Hi, my name is Kim Krieger. I'm a nurse and paramedic, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, trauma uh, and blood administration and uh, burns. So why don't we get started? Uh, trauma poses a, a very significant uh, threat to life, and it's important for us as uh, providers to identify injuries and transporting patients uh, to appropriate trauma centers for definitive care. Uh, you can have uh, minor injuries, you can have major injuries. Uh, we need to make the right uh, decisions for that. And again, we have to uh, identify these life-threatening illnesses and injuries uh, because it will improve patient outcomes. Uh, Pre-hospital, we're talking about scene safety, uh, rapid immobilization and stabilization, and then transporting to the uh, proper facility. And so we need to make the determination on scene, is this an ALS uh, transport or a BLS transport? And if we're transferring patients from another facility, we have to make sure that we uh, uh, transport lab results, CT scans, x-rays, uh, and uh, paperwork for the patient. Uh, talking about morbidity and mortality, um, basically we're talking about disability and death. Uh, morbidity refers to non-fatal injuries and disability, and mortality refers to a death caused by injury and, uh, or disease. Uh, for our pediatric population, the leading cause of death is, in fact, trauma. And also one of our roles is trying to prevent uh, trauma and providing quality uh, care to, uh, to our patients. And another important thing we need to do is prevent any secondary injuries uh, so that the patient doesn't have a, a, a bad outcome. Uh, we should all be familiar with the different uh, laws of Newton. Uh, they give us, give us some idea on what maybe the uh, severe impact is for the patients that we are dealing with, uh, whether medical or trauma. Uh, different types of trauma, we basically have the blunt, uh, blunt injuries, and um, then we have the uh, penetrating injuries. In some ways, blunt injuries are more uh, devastating or uh, dangerous for the patient than penetrating, because if somebody has a hole in their chest, you can see it and it gives everybody's attention, whereas blunt injuries can be very subtle and be very uh, hidden, and we may not uh, notice them if we're not paying attention. Then we have deceleration injuries. A uh, common cause of this is automobile accidents and motorcycle accidents or patients that have fallen from um, great height. And things that happen here is there are shearing injuries that take place within, the, uh, within the, the body. There's avulsing injuries and then there's rupturing injuries. The external force injuries, uh, there's external forces that are violating body tissues. And um, these are the gunshot wounds, stabbings, any type of projectile, say like in explosions. Uh, and the Injury and the severity is going to depend on where exactly in the body the uh, uh, injury is taking place, the mass behind the uh, projectiles or the, uh, the wounds, uh, the bullets, and what's the velocity of the, uh, the foreign object. number of things that we need to look at uh, determining uh, who is going to require um, care at a uh, level one or level two trauma center. Uh, and these are listed here. Uh, ejection from an automobile is uh, extremely dangerous for our patients. If uh, we have a patient who d is looking fairly good, but there's a, somebody in the vehicle that was with him is dead, we need to ask ourselves, why isn't this person, uh, person dead or uh, also severely injured? Uh, then our pedestrians, that's always a great risk because you have a lot of mass and force that is uh, impacting these people. Uh, and any time you have intrusions into the compartment of the vehicle, that uh, should be a red flag for us. And if there's great deformity uh, to the vehicle, rollovers are extremely dangerous because we have no idea what, uh, in fact, uh, is going on with that patient uh, as opposed to a patient that is uh, uh, restrained in the vehicle. So triage started uh, by a French... Uh, uh, person who I forget the name at this time, but basically wanted the greatest good for the greatest number of uh, patients that we have. And there's a number of different uh, triage systems out there. There's the SALT triage, there's the uh, START triage, and some others that are out there. And we basically have four categories. The uh, immediate or red uh, impacts the airway, breathing, and circulation, head trauma, patients that are in shock. Uh, if we don't intervene, they may, uh, in fact, end up dying. Then there's the yellow. They're serious, but they're stable at this time. Uh, often orthopedic and back injuries. Our min minimal patients, our green patients, are, uh, could be called, considered the walking wounded. And an expectant are the uh, black patients. They're the ones that are going to die no matter what we do based on the resources that we uh, have. 
And so we need to have some type of triage system so that we can uh, provide the best care for the uh, most amount of patients. And we need to remember that just because a patient is green or yellow initially doesn't mean that they can't change to the red category. So the book uh, that uh, we're using talks about the START triage. And it's simple triage and rapid uh, transport, the uh, acronym for it there. Um, and we're looking at the walking wounded again. Uh, we're looking in at the non-walking patients. And then we go down to the hemodynamic status of our patients. And then we look at the neural status. And there's also a jump start triage. And this is uh, uh, for pediatric patients or patients that are less than 100 pounds. And this is just a slide that shows you the different steps in the uh, triage system. Uh, for the START triage, the steps that we go through to determine which category we're going to place our patients in. And then this is just a slide showing the dump, uh, jump start triage for our pediatric patients and the stages that, we, uh, uh, that they uh, go through and what we're going to do for them. Uh, this is generally used for patients or children that are younger than eight years, uh, and again, they weigh less than 100 pounds. And it's similar to the START triage in many ways. Um, differences uh, do include in this that there's an immediate pulse check of our non-breathing patients, our pediatric patients, um, and these are uh, labeled as black if there's no pulse found. Um, then they open the airway with manual maneuver uh, for a patient that does in fact have a pulse but is not breathing. Also looking at the rate of uh, respirations and then what the hemodynamic status of this patient is. There's trauma scoring systems, which are used both pre-hospital and in the hospital to uh, uh, give us some clue about how severely injured our uh, patient might be. There's a Glasgow Coma Scale that uh, we are all familiar with. Uh, I like the uh, acronym Extra Value Meal, $4.56. Uh, that's a nice down and dirty way of uh, remembering what exactly is in the, uh, uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale. We're looking at the uh, level of consciousness. Uh, we're going through the eye opening, the verbal response, and the motor response. And then we've got our score. Um, highest is uh, 15, and the lowest is 3. And the old standard is a flesinate intubate, which is sometimes uh, true and sometimes now we have to uh, look at the patient clinically. It uh, can also be used to look at patients that have uh, medical conditions, such as drug overdoses, metabolic disorders, things like that. And the trauma score, that is basically a predictor of the likelihood of uh, patient uh, survival. And this is a Glasgow Coma Scale again here. Uh, and that score ranges from 1 to 16, with score 16 being the best. And there you're looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale, the respiratory rate, the respiratory expansion, systolic blood pressure, and cap refill. What it doesn't do is it doesn't accurately predict survivability in patients with severe head injuries, however. So we need to remember that. So again, here's a Glasgow Coma Scale. And then here's a trauma scoring system. So a Glasgow Coma Scale is a little simpler. The uh, trauma scoring, this trauma scoring system here is a little more uh, complicated, but they both have their places in uh, care of our trauma uh, patients. Then we have the revised trauma score, and this is uh, used to uh, determine the severity of injury. And what it's looking at, it's looking at the respiratory rate, the systolic blood pressure, and a Glasgow Coma Scale. And the numbers are anywhere from 0 to 13. Uh, the worse off the patient is, the lower the score they're going to have. Uh, and this is really pretty impractical in the, uh, the pre-hospital environment. It's used more uh, efficiently in, in the hospital. Uh, it doesn't readily, uh, readily identify um, uh, the small percentage of severely injured trauma patients, however, whose vital signs at that time don't actually reflect uh, or represent their actual condition. So we have to be uh, worried about that. Uh, Many times our patients have compensatory mechanisms that are maintaining their vital signs, our patients that are early stages of shock. And so basically it comes down to our clinical assessment of the patient uh, using our, our brains and our uh, uh, assessment skills that we've uh, developed over the years. Then you've got the abbreviated injury scale. And this was designed to provide a reasonably accurate means of uh, ranking the severity of injuries. And it looks at six different body regions and then it gives us an uh, individual score to each of these injuries. And what they're looking at is they're looking at the head, the neck, the thorax, the abdomen, and the spine, and the extremities. And that's got a scale of one, one to six. Uh, minor injuries are given, uh, would be number one, with uh, injuries that are on survival have a, a score of six. And this looks only at a specific injury. It doesn't look at multiple injuries or multiple multi-system injuries of our patients. And here's the uh, 
what a revised uh, trauma score would look like uh, if you, in fact, would use that. Again, this is more uh, helpful in the hospital. And then we have the injury severity score, another uh, trauma scoring system. And this is an anatomic scoring system that provides sort of an overall score of, uh, for patients with multiple injuries. And it quantifies these multiple uh, system injuries uh, with the use of this score. And there's the, um, uh, anywhere, anywhere the number for the score is anywhere from 1 to 75, with 1 as a minor injury and 75 having a high mortality rate. Again, not useful pre-hospital. Uh, patients with an injury survival or a severity score of uh, greater than 15 are generally considered to have major uh, trauma, and they require immediate uh, attention and need to be transferred to a level one trauma facility. Uh, this is uh, often used in the uh, uh, trauma registry uh, for data collection and research purposes. And then we have the trauma injury uh, severity score, and this uh, calculates survival probability of our critically injured or uh, ill patients. Uh, and this uses the ISS and revised trauma score, plus it looks at the patient's age. Uh, and again, not really used in the transport setting. Uh, generally, when you're talking about um, ages of patients, uh, generally the elderly, the older patients, tend not to do as well with the same injuries that a younger patient uh, might have. And this is what the uh, trauma scoring system uh, would look like for the uh, ISS, the things that they're going to be looking at. So we have different levels of trauma care, uh, from level one to level four. Level one has the uh, greatest resources, um, and then it works its way down. So level ones, they're regional centers. A lot of times they're university uh, settings. Uh, they're generally in larger cities or heavily populated areas. Uh, and they um, have to be capable of providing every aspect of trauma care, from prevention uh, through rehabilitation. Then you have level two facilities. Uh, generally less populated areas. Uh, they're expected to provide initial definitive care regardless of the injury severity. So they have a lot of the same resources that the level ones do. Uh, they may be academic institutions or they could be public-private uh, community facilities. Their uh, care is somewhat less comprehensive of level one trauma uh, centers. Level one trauma centers uh, are, are need to do research, whereas level twos don't necessarily have to do research. Moving down to level three, these are basically, for the most part, community centers, and, and these are areas that don't have a level one or level two facilities. They assess the patient, they resuscitate them, uh, provide emergency care and stabilization until they can be transferred uh, to a higher level of uh, uh, care. And they have protocols in place that would uh, help them to determine who needs to go to a uh, higher facility. And then you have the level four facilities, uh, generally found in more remote areas, outlying areas where there's a higher level of care and they provide advanced trauma life support prior to transfer, uh, transfer uh, to the higher level facility. Uh, this could be a clinic, urgent care facility, or a smaller hospital. Initially, all of these levels, no matter what they are, are uh, expected to provide the same high quality care initially for the patient. Again, it doesn't depend on their classification. And trauma centers are categorized as uh, either adult trauma centers or pediatric trauma centers. They don't necessarily have to be both. Pediatric trauma centers are less common than uh, the adult levels. And this is just a slide that shows different levels of uh, care that's uh, provided in level two uh, trauma centers, and they go through the uh, patient characteristics or their conditions or injuries that they have, what the mechanism of the injury is, um, and then from there they uh, uh, take care of the patient or decide to transfer the uh, patient out. And this is set up by the American College of Surgeons. So we have our general trauma management for patient. Uh, and we're speaking of patients that uh, are very ill and in need of close assessment or severely injured. And like any of our severely injured patients, we're uh, focused on the airway, breathing, and circulation, our ABCs. And in any, any hospital that a patient would go to, uh, the management is based on the advanced trauma life support guidelines through the American College of Surgeons. Uh, again, immediate attention is directed to the ABCs because that's when it's going to kill the patient uh, uh, the quickest. And we're talking about endotracheal uh, two placement airway management, what are the breast sounds, what are the untitled CO2. We're looking at the cardiovascular status and uh, uh, trauma resuscitation for the patient. Uh, need to get as much uh, 
medical information, medical histories you can from the patient uh, or the staff. And then we uh, need to remember that we need to do repeated uh, assessments, uh, head to toe, uh, focus assessments based on what uh, our assessment shows us about the patient. Because by repeated assessments, we can decrease the possibility of missed injuries. Um, and this is often uh, uh, very important when we talk about our multi-system trauma patients uh, as opposed to a patient that has one injury. The one injury can uh, have bad consequences for our patients. Hypothermia is never good for our trauma patients. If you go in many of the uh, trauma uh, centers in their trauma room, it is a lot warmer than the, uh, the rest of the emergency department or trauma area. Uh, because again, like I said, trauma patients don't do well uh, if they're hypothermic, and we need to remember this when we're talking about uh, patients that we uh, find in a cold weather environment, uh, when we expose them, when we're doing our, our exam, and so we need to be uh, very uh, aware of that. Uh, also have to be aware of the injury in these cold environments and the treatment that we provide. Uh, some of our patients need uh, a lot of fluid, whether uh, crystalloids or blood, and we need to remember to try and provide them with warm fluids because, um, again, cold fluids uh, can add to the uh, uh, bad outcomes of our patients. By uh, monitoring our patients, uh, we can uh, reduce morbidity and mortality a lot of times. Uh, with hypothermia, uh, if we don't uh, manage that uh, as best we can, the mortality rates can approach 100%. If we are transferring patients uh, from one facility to the next facility, uh, it's really important that we bring any uh, imaging with us to the uh, hospital that we're going to be taking them to. Uh, it helps if you're going to be on a transporting unit to have some understanding of uh, what we're looking for with the uh, standard x-rays, with the CT scans. Uh, it can help us manage the patient. Uh, it can give, a head, give us heads up on what uh, we need to be looking for. Um, based on the x-rays and the CT scans, uh, confirms placement of our ET tube, uh, along with our end tidal CO2. If there's any invasive lines that are put in, uh, we can see that. Uh, so our standard x-rays, that's uh, usually what uh, is done first. Um, they provide limited uh, uh, information for us, but it can be very helpful information. Um, we're, uh, we're looking, when we're looking on the, the x-rays, we're looking for structure and landmark verification. We can see injuries like uh, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. We can look at symmet uh, symmetry of the structures. Uh, we can find any foreign object uh, that might be in the, the person. Then there's a com uh, computed tomography. Uh, CAT scans uh, can show us uh, head bleeds, uh, bleeding internally in the body. Uh, sometimes complex fractures, which may not show up on the standard x-ray, are going to show up on the, uh, the CT scans. And typically, these are used in, uh, for scanning heads, uh, the C-spine, chest, abdominal, pelvic regions. Then you have the MRIs. Uh, some hospitals have this, some don't. Uh, what's nice now is a lot of these uh, uh, radiographic studies are now put on CDs, uh, so it's a lot easier to carry and transport. Uh, MRIs are generally limited use in uh, our major trauma patients based on the uh, time uh, factor of doing these procedures. So it's more likely to have uh, x-rays and CT scans. There's a FAST ultrasonography. It stands for Focus Assessment uh, with Sonography for Trauma. And this is directed at identifying the presence of free interperitoneal uh, or pericardial fluids, uh, generally performed in the emergency department or the trauma room. Uh, it's in many uh, times has replaced the uh, diagnostic peritoneal lavage, uh, DPL, though that is still done. Uh, it's decreased the need for uh, laparotomy because it's going to give uh, them a heads up about what uh, is maybe going on with the patient, what they need to do. Do we need to go to the operating room right away or can we just uh, uh, assess this patient and we don't have to rush off to the operating room? Uh, some uh, pre-hospital systems have adopted this uh, in their systems pre-hospital. Uh, and it's shown in a, a promising to identifying early identification, again, of abdominal bleeding and trauma. Uh, and looking at different areas of the abdomen, also looking at different areas of the, uh, the chest. There's also intra-abdominal pressure monitoring, IAP. Uh, the abdomen can have uh, intra-abdominal hypertension, which leads to uh, in, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. And normally when we think of compartment syndrome, we think of the extremities, but this can also take place in the abdomen. And if this isn't taken care of, uh, the person can die. 
ACS can lead to end organ damage and multi-system organ failure uh, during critical illnesses and injuries uh, that our patients are undergoing. Uh, there's a variety of different devices that is used for this. These are the different types of the apartment, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, you've got the primary, and this is where you're going to need uh, surgical interventions um, to manage this. Um, secondary, uh, this is something that happens outside the abdomen. So say sepsis or burns can lead to abdominal uh, problems. And then recurrent, this is abdominal compartment syndrome that uh, was initially successfully managed and then now develops. It's like a secondary type of injury. And so this, by monitoring this, we, uh, they can prevent uh, um, complications from setting in uh, a lot of times. And so it's, I think it's really important for uh, the CCTPs to uh, maintain some proficiency in interpreting these images in collaboration with the physicians that um, uh, you're going to be taking the report from uh, for transferring these patients. And we need to, again, remember that we need to ask for the uh, copies of all these imaging and uh, results. All right, let's start going down to uh, specific injuries in the different body systems. Uh, so we're going to start out with the uh, thorax. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are seen every year in the emergency department uh, for thoracic trauma. And there's over 18,000 deaths uh, per year. Uh, studies have shown that one in four trauma deaths are directly related to uh, thoracic injuries. And as we're aware of, as, and as you can see in some of the, uh, some of the organs here in the, uh, the chest, there's a lot of important things that uh, are located in our thorax. We've got the ribs that uh, can get fractured and create uh, underlying damage. The sternum can be injured. We've got the lungs. We have the mediastinum. We've got our heart. We've got the subclavian. We have the aorta. So a lot of things that can be uh, severely injured based on what uh, is going on with our patient. We also have the diaphragm. The diaphragm can be uh, damaged and create problems both uh, abdominally and thoracic, uh, uh, in the thoracic cavity. And our big concern here is uh, our vascular system. Again, the aorta, subclavian, are big uh, vessels. The heart can um, uh, run into problems with uh, <coughs> rupturing hole and holes. We also have to worry about the oxygenation and ventil uh, ventilation that can be impacted by either blunt or penetrating trauma in the uh, thorax. Um, majority of the chest uh, uh, thoracic trauma involves a chest wall, uh, chest injuries there. And we have to remember that uh, the reason we're able to ventilate and breathe is because we have our pressure gradient. And if there's a uh, uh, tear in the uh, chest uh, cavity, the chest wall, that's going to impact that. The things that we're looking for in the chest and that can happen to our patients is we can have simple pneumothorax, we can have an open pneumothorax, there's a tension pneumothorax, we can also have flail chest, hemothorax, we can have tracheal bronchial injuries, and we can also have pulmonary contusions. And so we need to be prepared for that and assess it. We have to be like detectives. So we'll start out with the open pneumothorax, uh, classically called a sucking chest wound. Um, you can uh, sometimes hear the sucking as a person is breathing uh, in or out. And so again, we can have open pneumothorax, we can have closed pneumothorax. Uh, then we have the simple pneumothorax, and simple pneumothorax is oftentimes uh, difficult to find, especially pre-hospital where it's noisy. You may not pick up that there's a pneumothorax because it's a simple one and it hasn't impacted the patient yet. Uh, and sometimes uh, in the trauma center, the emergency department, it's not picked up until they actually get a uh, chest x-ray, depending on the size of it. The tension pneumothorax is going to kill fairly rapidly. Uh, it's basically pushing uh, the organs in the chest over to one side, and it needs to be uh, treated fairly rapidly if we want to have an improvement in our patient. It also amazes me uh, all the chest x-rays that you can find online that show a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax should uh, hopefully be found on a clinical, uh, your clinical assessment. Uh, the big thing with pneumothorax is, besides the uh, uh, cardiovascular effects, is that the patient's going to get hypoxic. So here's an open pneumothorax. Uh, the air is going in and out, and again, you've got that sucking wound. And the treatment for this is we're going to put an occlusive dressing on. Uh, initially, we can use our gloved hand to do that. Uh, and then uh, as soon as we get a chance, we can uh, get our occlusive dressing and then tape on uh, three sides. Uh, so that prevents the tension, uh, hopefully, pneumothorax from developing. Uh, and you can also lift up the, uh, the dressing uh, to let air out. 
Uh, big complaint on our patients uh, for an isolated open pneumothorax is going to be complaining of difficulty breathing. Again, you've got that sucking chest wound, you've got that penetrating uh, trauma. Um, they're going to be tachypnic. We need to make sure with any patient uh, that we maintain an open airway, high flow oxygen, and like I said, immediately put your gloved hand on there uh, initially and then get the occlusive dressing on there. And then that, by taping on three sides, it works somewhat like a flutter valve. And then large bore IVs for this patient. Oftentimes, there's other ser serious injuries that take place along with the uh, open pneumothorax. Uh, and again, we're monitoring the vital signs, the patient's mentation, their ECG, and the oxygen saturation. If they're intubated, we're going to be monitoring their uh, end tidal CO2. And we need to specifically uh, prepare and assess and watch for the development of a tension pneumothorax because they may need needle decompression. Uh, chest tube um, may need to be inserted, and that's one of the things you may need to discuss with the physician uh, at the uh, hospital that's sending the patient out, if this is a transfer, whether or not a chest tube should be put in before you actually transport the patient. And if the chest tube is in place, you need to make sure that you monitor uh, uh, as if it's working uh, and if there's any blood that's developing in there. So here they're oxygenating the patient, high flow oxygen, initially putting a gloved hand on the chest. Uh, and then getting the occlusive dressing and taping it on three sides. The uh, open pneumothorax, again, you may need to uh, uh, needle the chest, uh, but again, you're going to need a large bore IV. Uh, I prefer having two in there, and then, like I mentioned, monitoring the vital signs, the O2 SAT, uh, cardiac monitor, and watching for development of a tension pneumothorax, because that will kill the patient. This is a simple pneumothorax. Uh, again, I uh, put arrows in there. Um, if you look carefully on the right side, on the left, uh, left, left chest, there's a definite line. Uh, again, if you're not paying good attention when you're looking at this, you could miss that. So you need to make sure that you look at it uh, very carefully if they do have any x-rays uh, so you can uh, uh, see what's uh, going on in there and uh, collaborate with the physician that's going to be sending this patient out. Again, depending on the size, a patient may not have uh, many signs or symptoms, but it can develop into a tension pneumothorax. Uh, this is often associated with our trauma patients with uh, rib fractures because they get driven into the, rim, uh, rib, rib, into the lung, uh, which creates the uh, uh, collapsed lung there, leading to spontaneous pneumo. So here's our tension pneumothorax. Uh, in this case, it's on the left side. The lung is collapsed. And every time the patient uh, breathes in, some of that air is going to leak out into the uh, chest cavity, creating more and more pressure. And eventually, in this case, everything's going to be pushed over to the uh, right side of the chest. This is life-threatening. Uh, if we don't uh, manage this with a chest tube or a uh, needle decompression, uh, the person will die. And again, we need to remember that a simple pneumothorax uh, could uh, lead to a, a tension pneumothorax, or if we have an open pneumothorax, uh, pressure can build up, can also develop into tension. So our patient's going to, if they're conscious, um, going to be very anxious. Uh, they'll be having dyspnea. You'll be seeing JVD on patients, whether they're conscious or unconscious. Uh, they're breathing fast. They will develop tracheal deviation. Uh, and tracheal deviation is often hard to see. What is uh, more helpful is if you take your fingers and start at the top of the trachea and just follow the trachea down with your fingers, you're more likely to feel the trachea moving to one side because the upper trachea is pretty well anchored, uh, where the lower tra uh, trachea isn't. And so you're not going to necessarily see the lower trachea where it's starting to angle. So I found it helpful to take my two fingers and just follow the trachea down. Uh, you may also see some tracheal tugging as a patient breathes in. Uh, if they're intubated, who's ever ventilating them, may notice you're getting some resistance when you squeeze that bag. Um, and so there's more pressure to, uh, uh, to ventilate this person. Or if they're on a ventilator, you're going to have high ventilator, high pressure alarms that are going off on, them, on the, uh, the alarms. Uh, you'll have absent or greatly diminished breast sounds in the affected sides. There's also something that you may feel. It's called pulses paradoxus. Uh, when you take a pulse, you'll have a strong pulse, a weak pulse, a strong pulse, a weak pulse. It'll repeat itself. And if you look on the ECG, what you might see is a tall QRS complex, a small QRS complex, a tall QRS complex uh, alternating. Also, if they have a CVP line in, you'll get an elevated uh, central venous pressure. Uh, the equipment you need for this is basically a 14-gauge uh, IV catheter, uh, 
two and a half to three inches, not your standard one and a quarter is generally required. Your body substance isolation, your gloves, uh, a 10 ml syringe. Uh, and what you can do is you can put uh, one or two uh, mls of sterile saline in the syringe, and that way when you uh, uh, stick the needle through the chest and put, have your syringe on, you get uh, air bubbles that come out there. Uh, you need something to clean the chest. Even if this is an uh, emergency procedure, you still want to clean the chest, uh, get the germs off there. And then once you get it in, you can put, uh, there's different flutter valves, Heimlich, um, you can use a, a non-lubricated condom, or you can take a, gl a glove finger, depending on what you've got there. And then after you're done, just put a sterile dressing on. I think the only contraindication to needling somebody's chest is if they don't need it. So here they discovered the uh, patient had attention pneumothorax based on your assessment, uh, getting the equipment ready. You want to find the uh, appropriate spot. It's in the second intercostal space over the top of the third rib, and you want to go over the top of the third rib because you have nerves and uh, blood vessels underneath the ribs, and you want to do the uh, midclavicular line uh, and inserting that. You've got your uh, aseptic technique, and then you've got a flutter valve. Uh, no matter what you use, that is optional. And at a 90 degree angle, inserting the needle over the top of the uh, uh, rib and then down into the, uh, into the chest. Um, take the needle out there and you can again uh, have the syringe if there's, uh, uh, use a syringe with bubbles in there, you should be getting uh, air bubbles in the syringe. Uh, you may hear, hear a whoosh of air, but again it depends on how noisy the uh, uh, environment is. And then you want to uh, tape it in place. So hemothorax. So now instead of air in the chest cavity, we actually, we actually have blood in the chest cavity from uh, blood vessels that are being uh, ripped or torn or lacerated. Uh, the patient with a, a massive uh, hemothorax can go into a hypovolemic shock. Uh, it's also um, harming the lung. Uh, and if it's a massive one, there's been as much as 1,500 mLs of uh, blood um, in the uh, pleural space there. Um, and there can be up to 3,000 milliliters of blood in there, so you can see that this person's uh, bleeding out there. This can happen from both uh, penetrating trauma and blunt trauma. Uh, this, could, this could be from a tumor in the chest that is uh, um, uh, eaten away through the uh, uh, blood vessel. And the things you're going to see with these patients are a lot of things you're going to see with the uh, tension pneumothorax. They're going to be hypoxic, so they're going to be agitated. They're going to be hypotensive because of all the blood loss uh, internally. Heart rate's going to be going fast, tachycardic. They're going to have tachypnea. If you listen for breath sounds, they're going to be absent or uh, greatly diminished. If you would percuss a chest, which not uh, many people do, and especially difficult in a pre-hospital environment, uh, it would be dull uh, sound, whereas if it was a tension with thorax, it would be more of a higher pitch sound. Uh, the patient might be uh, having hemoptysis, coughing up bloods, uh, blood, and their uh, shock is going to get uh, worse. Uh, and if you do have a CVP line, uh, that is going to be a, a falling. Uh, a down and dirty way to ask, uh, find out if this is a hemothorax versus a uh, 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 tension pneumothorax. With a tension pneumothorax, you're going to be getting uh, JVD. With a massive hemothorax, you won't get that JVD because all the blood is in the chest cavity. So that's sort of a down and dirty way that I've used in the past to uh, make a determination uh, pre-hospital. Is this a uh, tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax? But we need, do need to remember that uh, they can, the patient can have both a, a hemo and a, a pneumothorax. So management, we're managing the airway, high flow oxygen. Uh, this is a low, low and go situation. Uh, fluid, uh, uh, resuscitation with them. Uh, we'd like to get their blood pressure to at least 90, uh, if not a little bit higher, or a mean arterial pressure of uh, 65. You do need to be careful that if you give too much fluid, raise the blood pressure too high, you can actually dislodge clots that are formed and uh, actually make, uh, make the bleeding worse. They can also develop a tension pneumothorax um, from the hemothorax. So this, this is a picture that uh, the collapsed lung, and then you look on the, uh, the right lung on the left there, it's uh, red, the pleural space is uh, filled with blood, and this would be a massive uh, hemothorax. What these patients are going to need to have done is have a chest tube inserted. So if it's at a uh, hospital, they will, um, should have done that. 
Uh, if it's not done at that hospital and the patient doesn't need it at the time, they will put one in uh, at the receiving hospital there. So chest tubes can um, both remove air or they can remove fluid from the, uh, the pleural cavity. And so you may need to transport a patient that does in fact have a chest tube uh, uh, in them. And so you need to be familiar with uh, chest tubes and their monitoring and how they work. Uh, the equipment that's going to be needed uh, for this is, uh, again, your uh, protective uh, gear, a scalpel, chest tubes. Y usually a minimum of a 36 uh, French chest tube on adults uh, is the minimum that uh, you want to have in this patient. You're going to need some clamps, uh, sterile dressings, suture material, uh, something to clean the skin. If the patient's awake, they will uh, um, anesthetize the area because uh, it's extremely painful. You have to make sure that you uh, have the patient's uh, arm secured if they are conscious because they're not going to like this. Um, you're going to have to have some type of collection chamber, the chest tube itself. And uh, mechanical suction uh, needs to be available, uh, but it's not always used depending on uh, uh, what, uh, what the patient is doing. And so chest tubes are going to be put in for uh, pneumothoraxes, uh, hemothoraxes or combined hemopneumothoraxes. Uh, or sometimes there's a pus in the uh, pleural cavity and it can also be used uh, for that. For the most part, we're going to be seeing it uh, for our trauma patients. So here's a representation, and it shows a chest tube that's in place. Uh, and again, they're um, putting it in uh, fairly rapidly if the patient is in uh, serious shape or if the patient is, isn't crashing, uh, they can take a little more time uh, to put it in. Complications that can happen with our uh, uh, patient and the chest tube is that they could get more pneumothoraxes. Uh, it can accidentally come out, and that's really important when you're transporting the patient from the uh, hospital bed onto your uh, cot and getting them into the uh, ambulance or the helicopter, that somebody needs to uh, monitor the, uh, uh, the pleurovac or whatever is being used uh, and the tubing itself so that it doesn't come out. These, uh, the chest tubes will be sutured in place and there will be a uh, dressing over it, but they still can't come out. Uh, chest tubes uh, can also injure the lung tissue itself, so they will also check, always check uh, before putting the chest tube in. Oftentimes, the physician will have a sterile glove and stick the finger after they get into the pleural cavity, stick his or her finger in there to make sure that they don't feel any uh, lung tissue. Uh, can also lacerate intercostal uh, blood vessels. Uh, could create a hemothorax or bleeding, uh, and uh, it could be misplaced and go below the diaphragm. And an infection can set in. Again, that's why you need to make sure that the uh, chest tube, uh, uh, the skin is uh, properly prepped there. You want to make it as uh, clean, sterile as possible. Before moving your patient again, make sure that all the connections are taped or banded together because we don't want them to come apart. Uh, make sure the dressing over the site is uh, secured. Uh, some uh, people will take a uh, uh, permanent marker and mark on the chest tube where, in fact, the uh, chest tube is when uh, you pick the patient up, uh, and that way it allows you to see if the chest tube has come uh, out or gone uh, in deeper there. And again, it will be done, but just you just want to make sure that the tube hasn't been, been in fact, uh, sutured into place and uh, taped. Uh, we don't want to assume that it uh, can. You don't want to lift up the collection chamber above the level of the chest. You always want to make sure that it's below the level of the chest. Uh, it does help when you're transporting the patient to uh, keep the tubing coiled uh, because you don't want to get kinked because that will uh, act as an obstruction. Uh, and then just make sure that you uh, assess and document any bubbling in the water seal area of the uh, chest tube and how much uh, uh, blood uh, is in the collection chamber and what it's looking like. You do not want to clamp the tubes because that could lead to a tension pneumothorax, which you don't want to have. If there's continuous bubbling, what you patient, uh, injury that the patient may also have is a tracheal bronchial laceration, something to pay attention to. Uh, because of the uh, chance for a massive amount of bleeding, uh, these patients may, uh, in fact, need to also be getting uh, blood, uh, blood infusions on there. And we'll be talking about uh, blood administration uh, later on. So here's a patient who's going to need uh, a chest tube, and if it's a tension, if it's a pneumothorax, they will um, direct the uh, chest tube uh, sometimes more upward. If it's a hemothorax, they'll direct the uh, chest tube more downward. 
anywhere they're going to do uh, uh, find the site, and it's uh, generally on the lateral side of where the uh, injury is. Uh, this is a picture of a collection uh, devices, uh, tubing that's going to be connected to the chest tube. Again, you want to make sure you good use good aseptic technique uh, when they're doing this. Uh, again, if the patient is crashing, they may not use the uh, uh, anesthetized area because they need to get in. Uh, but generally, if they're going to anesthetize the area if they've got the time. Uh, again, they've marked the uh, tube for the desired uh, <coughs> length of insertion. You want to clamp the distal end of the tube uh, with a large clamp. Um, and also the proximal end, because that's going to help get the chest tube in. You want to clamp the, uh, the distal end, because if it's a hemothorax, you want blood pouring out of there. Then they're going to take the scalpel, make a transverse incision. Uh, generally, it's over the uh, fifth rib at the mid-axillary line. And they're actually going to tunnel uh, over the fifth rib. Again, they're going over the top of the rib uh, with their, their large clamp here. Uh, they're going to push it through the pleural uh, uh, space and then spread the clamp and leave that clamp in place. Uh, and then they've got their chest tube with a clamp on it. And they're going to, uh, again, check to make sure there's no lung tissue there uh, and advance the chest tube with the uh, clamp on it through the space that's been uh, created. They will then uh, remove the clamps uh, and advance the tube uh, where they want it, uh, the depth that they want it in. They'll uh, connect the collection device, and it's going to have a one-way valve. That's uh, a Heimlich valve in this case. Uh, otherwise, they'll put it right onto the, uh, uh, the pleurovac, uh, the tubing from there. Uh, they'll take the uh, uh, distal clamp off. They're going to be securing the tube in place uh, with suture material and then close the wound. And then they're going to put some type of occlusive dressing over the wound. Because remember, again, this is an open, open wound into the chest cavity. And again, our role is to make sure that uh, we monitor the, uh, the amount of uh, fluid that's coming out of the, uh, uh, the chest cavity, uh, monitor the patient's status, uh, the mentation, the respiratory status, vital, uh, vital sign, uh, all the things that we would manage on our patients. We have the flail chest and definition fracture in two or more places to two or more adjacent ribs. Uh, many flail segments are fairly subtle and easy to miss, so again, we need to do good assessments on them, uh, where some are quite obvious. So uh, again, based on the mechanism, what our patient's looking like, we need to do a really good assessment because it's easy, easy to miss. It uh, is often found in many of the serious chest injuries, and usually our serious chest injuries have more than one injury. Uh, there have been cases where patients, uh, they haven't found the flail segment for uh, up to six hours. Uh, one advantage of going to a level one trauma center, level two trauma center, is they're used to dealing with uh, lots of trauma patients, uh, and so they are more likely than a system or a hospital that doesn't see a lot of trauma patients to pick this up. Uh, but it, it does happen. You can also have what's called a central flail, and that's where the sternum is separated from the uh, ribs. And there's a thing called paradoxical respirations or movement, meaning when the patient inhales, the flail segment actually sucks in, and when the patient exhales, that flail segment will go, uh, go out. Uh, and what's actually happening is that flail segment isn't moving. It's the rest of the chest that's moving. Uh, besides the flail segment, the obvious injury that we can see there's oftentimes bruising to the underlying tissue, and so we can have a myocardial contusion or a pulmonary contusion. Uh, and that's uh, uh, creating a big problem for our patients with those uh, injuries, hypoxia, cardiovascular problems. But the patients, if, again, if they're conscious, are generally uh, they're complaining of what we might see is they're having dyspnea, severe pain because you've got fractured ribs. Uh, if you listen on the flail side, there's going to be some diminished uh, breath sounds. Uh, tenderness, if you would palpate it, you can oftentimes feel crepitus, and there's generally a bruise over the area. Uh, managing these patients, we want to uh, maintain an airway again, high flow oxygen, assist ventilation. Uh, many times these patients need to be intubated. Uh, way back when in the old days when I started out, the treatment was putting sandbags on uh, the flail segment, which if you think about it now, didn't make much sense, but um, we've learned a lot uh, since uh, those days. Again, oftentimes, uh, best treatment is intubating the patient. It's providing uh, positive uh, pressure. 
Uh, and if they're not intubated, be prepared to intubate these patients. Uh, you can put um, IV fluid, use that to help stabilize the segment and uh, tape that down. Uh, if this is a um, patient in the field, we need to get rapidly moving, and that's with any of our trauma patients that are severely injured. And monitoring the things that we're going to monitor, again, the O2 sat, the vital signs, their mentation, uh, things like that. Uh, these patients can also develop a tension pneumothorax or hemothorax. Uh, they can go into shock, respiratory failure because of pulmonary contusion, so we just need to uh, prepare for that. Pericardial tamponade, so the, uh, there's blood that's leaked into the pericardial space. And every time the heart beats, blood is uh, forced into this opening. And as you get more and more fluid in the pericardial space, it's sort of acting like a, a vice uh, on the heart, so it can't expand to uh, fill. And so you, the cardiac output is uh, going to be going down. And it's uh, generally more common in stab wounds and gunshot wounds, so gunshot wounds can cause it. Uh, generally used, caused by uh, penetrating trauma, though blunt trauma to the chest that fractures ribs can also cause it. And so there's either blood in the pericardial space um, or there's fluid of some kind. Uh, patients that uh, receive radiation for uh, cancer in the chest uh, can have a uh, cardiac tamponade. Uh, pacemaker wires can also cause that. So infections, pacemaker wires that have uh, moved, again, are trauma. Uh, anytime there's surgery to the chest, uh, this can happen. Patients that have cancer in the chest, uh, the tumor, again, can uh, erode uh, through the, uh, uh, into the pericardial space there. Uh, uh, big time MIs, uh, congestive heart failure can lead to a pericardial tamponade, renal failure, because that can lead to infections. Uh, the classic sign and symptom is again the, the Beck's triad. And here you have an area pulse pressure where they're getting hypotensin, hypotensive. There's jugular vein distension because the blood basically can't go forward, so it's got to go somewhere. So it, Think of it as a sort of backing up, and then muffled heart tones, because you've got this greater distance now between the outside of the person and the heart, so the heart sounds will sound muffled, so we need to monitor that. Uh, you may not have any pulses with CPR if the person is in cardiac arrest. And again, you've got that pulse, this uh, uh, paradoxical pulse and electrical alternons that you may see on that. Uh, again, hypotension, uh, as, this, as this proceeds, it can be cyanotic. Uh, again, dyspnea will kick in, they're going to be tachycardic. Uh, classic rhythm that you will see with pericardial tamponade is uh, pulses electrical activity. Uh, the CVP is also going to be going up if you are monitoring that. And if they do a chest x-ray and you look on the chest x-ray, if you look at the mediastinum, it's going to be wide, um, uh, a wide mediastinum. It's going to be the normal, <coughs> uh, normal width apart. And again, that's why it's important to, uh, to have some familiarity with uh, chest x-rays and what different uh, injuries look like. So again, BSI to uh, uh, treat this, uh, the cardiac monitor, and then your defibrillator again. There's different pericardiocentesis peri kits, uh, 50 cc syringe or ML, 50 ml syringe, again, uh, something to clean the skin with. Um, probium medications, uh, cardiac sedating, numbing medications, uh, uh, catheters uh, to do that. Uh, you may use a pre-hospital, may use a spinal needle, or your, your system may carry uh, specific catheters for this. Uh, drapes to uh, drape over the patient. Um, again, 16, 18 gauge spinal needle, uh, three-way stopcock, uh, scalpels, alligator clips. Again, depending on how you're going to be doing it. Uh, it is nice uh, if you have ultrasound, that can help. Uh, we're not going to have that pre-hospital, but they will have that in the hospital, and that can help them to... Uh, 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 do that properly. So here's a pericardiocentesis that they've done. So you've got the heart, and you can see that you've got, in the pericardial space, you've got uh, fluid of some kind, and you can see the needle that's going um, in there. So indications for this would be uh, a patient with chest trauma. There's the signs and symptoms of a cardiac tamponade, um, and they may be impulsive electrical activity again. Uh, the physician may have done a fast exam where they can actually see this on the ultrasound. Uh, contraindications, well, if they don't have it, um, anything like that. We could uh, uh, give them arrhythmias. If you uh, go into the ventricle, it's going to get irritable. Uh, so you could, also, you could puncture the uh, ventricle. 
uh, and you don't want to do that. Uh, again, creating problems. Uh, you can lacerate the coronary arteries. You can lacerate the lung. Uh, you could give a tamponade uh, if they don't have one. Uh, you could give acute pulmonary um, uh, edema from fluid there. Uh, if your angle is extremely off, you could actually puncture the liver or the stomach. Uh, so we just want to uh, be aware of that. And we could also give them an infection, again, if we wouldn't do a good cleansing of the skin. So here this patient has a uh, cardiac tamponade, <coughs> and they've got their equipment. Uh, they're cleansing the area again. Uh, Premedicate the patient if that uh, is appropriate. Again, you want to make this as clean as uh, possible um, and ster as sterile as possible. Again, pre-hospital, it's uh, a little more difficult, but again, it cleans it as, uh, as best you can. So you want to, again, have the uh, proper site, and that's going to be on the uh, left side of the chest to the left of the xiphoid. You're going to have your needle, whichever type of needle you're going to be using. Uh, in this case, they're infiltrating with some lidocaine to numb it up. Uh, oftentimes, that's not done pre-hospital there because we don't have the time. So there's your uh, big needle, spinal needle, uh, large syringe, 30-degree angle. And as you go through the skin, you want to start pulling back on the plunger. And as you can see on the right here, there's blood in the uh, syringe. And what you're going to be doing as you're going through the uh, skin towards the ipsilateral shoulder. That's a fancy name for the uh, shoulder on the left side on the same side there. So you want to be pulling back on the plunger. That way when you hit the pericardial space, you should start getting uh, fluid, blood, and you know you're in deep enough. You want to stop going any farther because you, you don't want to go into the, uh, uh, the ventricle. And then what you want to do is you want to re, uh, uh, generally take the needle out uh, pre-hospital. In the hospital, they may keep it in. Again, it's going to depend on your protocols, what you're going to do. But you want to save that syringe with the blood. Theoretically, if you're in the pericardial space, the blood is not going to clot because the clotting factors have been used up. If you are into the ventricle, the clot, uh, the blood in the syringe uh, will maybe clot. Uh, so that's why you want to save it because a physician may want to know and will ask you, is the blood clotted or not? Again, there is some uh, controversy on that, whether or not that actually happens. But, uh, that's what you want to do. You want to save that syringe so you can see if the blood clots or not. Some patients have aortic dissection <coughs> or transection. Uh, the aortic can rupture. That's the most devastating thing that happens because the patient's going to bleed out, and that's one of the uh, um, most common causes of immediate death when you're talking about motor vehicle crashes, uh, rapid deceleration injuries. Uh, the aorta, where it comes off the heart, uh, is fairly, uh, moves fairly easily compared to the rest of the aorta, which is anchored fairly well. And that can flop and uh, tear fairly uh, easily. It's uh, injured at the ligamentum arteriosum. And that's, again, due to deceleration injuries, whether motor vehicle crashes or uh, falls from great heights. Um, if you get tears there uh, and it ruptures, uh, it's almost immediately fatal. Patients that do have tears in this, uh, on the descending side uh, have a 15% chance of uh, staying alive until they do reach the operating room. And again, we need to do a good assessment. Uh, even in the hospital, there's a 30% mortality uh, rate. Pre-hospital, it can be very difficult to find a uh, aortic dissection. Uh, it's sometimes missed e even in hospitals there. So it comes with a good assessment on our uh, patients. If it's a uh, thoracic dissection, uh, you can take pulses and blood pressures in both arms. One arm will um, have a strong pulse and a, um, a higher blood pressure than the other arm, which will have a weaker pulse and a lower blood pressure. That's a clue that they may be having a um, uh, dissection there. Uh, they're going to be hypotensive, increased level of consciousness. Uh, our patients that have a history of hypertension uh, often, uh, again, will be hypertensive in one arm uh, and have a lower uh, blood pressure in the other arm. Uh, Definitely be having chest pain for thoracic dissection, may have some bruising. And again, if you look at the x-ray, uh, if it's in the hospital, you see a wide mediastinum. If it's an abdominal trauma, uh, and they've got a uh, abdominal uh, AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm, you may feel a pulsating mass and uh, diminished or no pulses uh, uh, in the feet. Uh, you do not, you want to make sure that you don't palpate 
extremely hard on the abdomen there because you don't want to uh, cause it uh, a rupture there. There may also be fractures uh, in the chest that you may feel when you palpate the uh, uh, chest, especially the first and second ribs up high. So again, management is open airway, ventilation, oxygenation. You may need to intubate the patient. Uh, IV fluids, if they are not hypotensive, you do not want to give a lot of IV fluids because adding IV fluids to somebody who's having the dissection can actually uh, cause it to get bigger. Uh, so if they are not hypotensive, you do not want to give uh, a lot of IV fluids. Uh, you may want to uh, uh, give uh, beta blockers, esmolol, metoprolol, again, to try and keep the blood pressure down. You like a mean blood pressure of 65 to 70. Uh, you don't want to get, uh, get it any higher than that. And then uh, rapid transport to uh, uh, the receiving hospital that you're going to. And give them a heads up uh, on what you're bringing in. Myocardial contusion, uh, they're going to be complaining of the same thing somebody that um, uh, has had an MI is going to uh, be complaining of. Uh, found in uh, motor vehicle crashes, uh, again, not wearing a seatbelt, there's no airbag, and they run into something, and their chest uh, then goes into the steering wheel, and uh, now they've got a myocardial contusion. Uh, nothing that we're necessarily going to see on the patient. Uh, but the, again, they're going to be having chest pain. They might be having palpitations. You might be seeing arrhythmias like PVCs, uh, VTAC, VFib. They could be having ST segment elevation uh, or new bundle branch blocks, which we're generally not going to know about that. Uh, if you listen uh, apically, you might be hearing a murmur. Uh, you can also hear a pericardial friction rub sometimes. And they may be tachycardic, and there's no explanation for it. So that might be a clue. And then they can be in cardiogenic shock. So again, we're generally not doing 12 leads on our trauma patients, but if your system does uh, do 12 leads and the patient uh, is uh, somewhat stable and you think they might have a myocardial contusion like they've got blood, blood chest trauma, you uh, may want to do a 12 lead uh, because it may uh, give you some important information. So oxygenation, you may need to use uh, some pharmacology if they're having arrhythmias. They could get a hemopericardium which can lead to pericardial tamponade. Uh, if it's severe enough, they can have a myocardial rupture and a ventricular aneurysm. Uh, generally, the, the myocardial contusion patients do fairly well, however. But again, we need to be prepared for the worst. Uh, diaphragmatic rupture is pretty interesting. Uh, as it says here, blunt penetrating trauma. Basically, what happens is the diaphragm gets uh, torn and stomach contents, intestines can actually go up into the chest cavity. Uh, usually it's due to blunt uh, uh, trauma, but again, it can have some uh, even penetrating trauma if it penetrates the uh, diaphragm. Some people have weakened uh, areas in the uh, diaphragm, and this can lead to, uh, when they have some blunt trauma, cause that tear in the, in the diaphragm. And so the abdominal organs uh, go into the uh, thoracic cavity. So they'll be complaining of abdominal pain, uh, going to be complaining of chest pain. There'll be an acute respiratory distress because now you've got something that doesn't belong in the uh, chest cavity that's um, pushing things out of the way. You will be hearing decreased breath sounds. And in the old classic, uh, they say that you may hear bowel sounds or abdominal sounds in the chest cavity. Uh, this is fairly rare, but it is a possibility. Uh, they could have subcutaneous emphysema because there might be air that's uh, leaked out there. You could have the obvious penetrating trauma to the abdomen. And if you look at uh, the patient's abdomen, most of us, we have rounded abdomens. And if you look at your patient and they've had some blunt trauma, and you look and their, their abdomen is sunken in, that might be a clue that they may, in fact, have a uh, ruptured diaphragm. Uh, you may need to assist the ventilation because they're obviously going to be having some respiratory distress there. Uh, oxygenation. Uh, you may want to put in a nasogastric tube or an orogastric tube to decompress the stomach. Uh, there's some controversy about that. Uh, you want to be careful if you're ventilating the patient and they do have a uh, ruptured diaphragm. Remember, the stomach uh, can be in the chest cavity and you don't have a good seal if you're using an ambu bag with a mask and you, you don't have a good airway open and you're getting air into the stomach. Well, that air in the stomach is going to expand the stomach and you can make the, uh, uh, the patient uh, worse. And you may uh, want to intubate these patients uh, early on to prevent that from happening. 
Uh, the next injury you're going to be talking about is the tracheobronchial disruption. Um, usually it's caused by uh, penetrating trauma. Uh, that's the most common, though blunt trauma could cause it. Uh, generally it happens within about, oh, an inch and a half, two inches of the crina, but can uh, actually occur anywhere along the uh, tracheobronchial tree. <coughs> These people are going to have uh, severe respiratory distress because it's part of the airway. They will be getting hypoxic. Uh, they're going to be tachycardic. Uh, they're going to be getting sub-Q air because air is going to be leaking out into the tissues. Uh, they may be having hemoptysis where they're coughing up blood. Uh, you can see jugular vein distension. Uh, your vessels get uh, uh, damaged there. And then again, you can have tracheal deviation that's taking place. Uh, to manage this, uh, again, this is a big life threat. Administer oxygen, uh, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, unless they start getting worse, and then you may uh, you know, need to intubate them. Uh, though if it's a transection, it's extremely difficult to uh, intubate these patients because the trachea is not lining up. Uh, may need to uh, needle decompress the chest if they uh, develop a tension pneumothorax. A chest tube uh, may be necessary. Again, it all depends on how, uh, how serious this injury is, how much damage there is, and what, uh, what the patient's doing. <coughs> Pulmonary contusion. So now the lung is uh, contused. And you can have uh, alveoli torn, you can have blood, ves blood vessels torn, so there can be bleeding that goes along with this. Uh, you can have fluid leaking out from this from the injured, uh, the tissue itself, and initial spaces around them. Um, basically, the lung uh, gets hit from the uh, inside of the chest wall, and what you have is these shearing forces that take place, which causes the uh, contusion uh, to happen. Uh, this is subtle. Uh, generally, pre-hospital, we don't see that. Uh, it's more likely to uh, develop in the hospital. But again, if you're transporting the patient from one hospital to the next, <coughs> you may uh, experience this uh, on your patient there. So again, early on, probably not going to see it again. It's very subtle, often missed, uh, uh, or maybe missed in the hospital because there's no signs and symptoms. But what you'll notice as this goes on, the patient's going to get uh, more and more hypoxic, so they're going to get more and more agitated, uh, trouble breathing, uh, tachycardic, uh, tachypnic, if you look at a chest x-ray, as this has been going on, it'll be more uh, opaque. Uh, it won't have the nice uh, black that you're going to see on most uh, uh, x-rays. If they did get a blood gas because they're getting hypoxic, uh, that's going to be getting uh, worse. What these people will do, again, depending on how uh, serious the contusion is, is they uh, may need to be put on a ventilator and get uh, uh, peep anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of water. or uh, uh, CPAP, again, 10 to 15 centimeters of water. Uh, these patients need to um, have some analgesia, analgesia uh, just like uh, many of our trauma patients, if they're stable enough to have that. Um, oxygen, IV, monitor, uh, vital signs, mentation, again, pulse ox, end title if they're intubated, uh, IV fluid resuscitation if uh, need be. Again, usually there's more than one injury that goes on. It's not, a lot of these are not isolated injuries. Could tear the esophagus, and basically this is generally going to be coming from uh, uh, some type of penetrating injury. It can be a bullet, uh, can be a knife, can be uh, projectiles from an explosion. It can also happen from somebody who's uh, uh, drank uh, alkali, acids, uh, things like that. There are some medical causes. If somebody's got cancer in that area, and you've got a tumor that again erodes the uh, tissue. Uh, some people have gastroesophageal reflux disease where the gas starts going up into the esophagus, that can cause erosions. And there's a condition called Mallory Weiss tears. These are from patients who uh, have excessive vomiting with strong force. That can also cause uh, tears in the esophagus. They'll have severe amount of pain um, in the area. They'll be running a fever because of eroded tissue the infection can se uh, set in. Uh, they have uh, dysphagia where they'll have trouble talking, uh, trouble swallowing. Uh, because of the uh, damage to the esophagus. They could have uh, some sub-Q air because it can also erode into uh, uh, the airway. And their pain is sort of pleuritic, a sharp type of pain. They may, if you look at the um, uh, x-ray, you may have some medial stinal uh, air or there's going to be some widening on the uh, imaging studies. If, uh, again, the airway gets eroded along with the esophagus. And you may even hear it's, a, it's described as sort of like a crunching sound, if you listen in the, uh, that area there. 
Uh, you need to manage the ABCs, um, like all of our patients. Uh, you have to be very careful if you put a nasogastric tube in because it may go in the stomach, but it may also go into that opening in the esophagus, and uh, you do not want to have that happen. So very, very careful if uh, an NG is going to be placed. Trichomatic asphyxia, the classic that you uh, see in books. Uh, some guy's by a loading dock on the ground, and he's standing next to the loading dock, and the truck backs up and doesn't see him, and uh, uh, s s smashes him between the loading dock and the truck. Uh, so it happens fairly suddenly, and uh, uh, you've got injury to the chest, and could also be the abdomen. And basically what it does is it pushes or forces the blood backward out of the right side of the heart. And if you look at this patient, you'll see the uh, jugular vein distension. Uh, you'll see veins also in the chest and the head uh, engorged with blood. And this is deoxygenated blood. And so the chest, neck, and head is going to look blue or purple, sort of like uh, an extreme case of a cyanosis. Uh, but this is not due uh, really as asphyxia when we think of it as as a, what we think of asphyxia, but it's, it's called uh, traumatic asphyxia. Uh, by itself, it's not fatal. These patients can do quite well. Uh, it, it looks really bad, but it's not necessarily uh, bad. Uh, so it may not be fatal, uh, though it can be. Uh, signs and symptoms, again, you can have this bluish, purplish discoloration of the chest, uh, uh, neck, and head. Uh, there can be associated injuries, which you need to be concerned about. And a lot of that has to do with how fast the truck was in backing up um, and how much force was put on the person. Uh, again, JVD, you, might, you can even see, if you look in the eyes, you have conjunct, uh, conjunctival bleeding, where blood vessels in the eyes uh, have uh, burst. And a lot of times, if you, once you get the truck away from them, you have this sharp line of demarcation uh, that separates the traumatic asphyxia area with the normal skin color below. Management, it's, okay, what's going on with the patient? Maybe you just need to provide supportive care with them, uh, for them, because they really didn't injure anything too bad. Otherwise, you need to treat the associated injuries and monitor for them. Again, anything in the chest cavity can get uh, damaged. Uh, if they are entrapped, uh, because, say, something fell on them, uh, say, a large tree, uh, again, manage them with oxygenation, uh, ventilation, uh, two large bore IVs if uh, they look in uh, serious shape. And then you need to have a, uh, de uh, develop a plan that, okay, what are we going to do if they have sudden hypertension? Uh, if they are entrapped for a prolonged period of time, the muscles will start releasing myoglobin and potassium uh, is collecting. And then when you get the person out of the uh, entrapment, whether the tree or the vehicle, again, they've been, it's been happening for a while, uh, all this myoglobin gets released and the potassium gets released, which adds uh, its own problems. Myoglobin can uh, lead to uh, uh, kidney failure down the road. Uh, high potassium can lead to cardiac problems. So we need to be prepared for that, uh, especially if you're transporting the patient from uh, one hospital to the next and it's a long transport time. You just need to be aware of that. Uh, ear injuries um, is uh, generally not life-threatening if it's an ear injury itself, <laughs> but it's what's uh, underneath the ears. That's our concern. Uh, and so if you've got uh, fluid coming from the ears and or nose, you always want to think of a basal skull fracture. Uh, and there's a thing called a halo test where if you drop fluid on a... Uh, uh, like a 4x4, four four, uh, the blood will separate out uh, from the, uh, the glucose and uh, uh, liquid, and it's, it looks, actually looks like a little halo. You can also do a glucose test on it, because there is glucose in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And so, the, again, the biggest thing isn't the uh, life threats, but it's what's underneath that can uh, cause a, a life threat. So, again, usually ear injuries are not... Uh, too big of a th uh, thing for them. Um, and when they have the neuro, uh, neuro emergencies uh, presentation, uh, they'll be talking about the HALO test. Uh, concern for the patient is they could have a ruptured tympanic membrane. And the biggest complaint for that for the patient would be they've got pain uh, in the ears. They might have vertigo where they, because uh, their balance is in that area. 
in the lungs. You can also have some vomiting uh, and some blood in the uh, ear canal. So basically, uh, if there is any bleeding, you can put some external dressings. Don't pack the ear canal well. Uh, they may need an antiemetic like Zofran uh, to prevent them from uh, vomiting. And if there are injuries, uh, if you are going to transport them by air, you just have to be aware of the fact that with pressure changes, that can cause uh, pain in the patient's ears. So just be aware of that. Eye injuries, again, an eye injury itself is not life-threatening. But again, if it's, uh, say, penetrating trauma, it's what's behind the eye. Uh, eye. Eyelid lacerations, again, nothing that's going to uh, uh, be life-threatening. Uh, but you've got to be careful of how much pressure you put on the globe of the eye because they could have another eye injury and they could have a, uh, a ruptured globe and you don't want to push on that and uh, push out the uh, uh, vitreous humor because uh, that's going to cause permanent blindness in the patient. So eyelid lacerations, put some uh, light direct pressure on there, put a dressing, but watch again how, how much you put on there. Uh, if there's uh, anything implanted, a penetrating object in the eye, you want to make sure that you uh, stabilize it and also want to patch the um, unaffected eye so that uh, the eyes aren't moving, consensual movement. Uh, something that you could see is a hyphema and basically that's blood in the anterior chamber of the eye uh, due to blunt trauma. And again, not life-threatening. Uh, these oftentimes heal up by themselves um, and uh, blood gets reabsorbed. Uh, but these people should see a, a uh, ophthalmologist and they will have one uh, at the hospital uh, when you transfer them. Uh, again, a heads up, letting them know that that's what they've got. <coughs> again, you want to patch both eyes. Uh, these eye injuries, if possible, you want to have them sitting as upright as possible uh, to limit the amount of pressure on the eye. And then they may need analgesics for the pain because uh, eye injuries can be uh, extremely painful. And you may need to give them something to uh, calm them down to because they might be very uh, uh, anxious. So again, isolated eye and ear injuries, uh, not so, uh, again, not life-threatening, but very anxious for the patient. So here's that globe rupture. Again, the thing that gives your, uh, your eyeball, your globe, its substance and its shape is a vitreous humor. And if the globe ruptures, that uh, leaks out and the body does not replace it and they will uh, uh, be blind in that eye. So we just want to, again, uh, cover the eyes, both of them. Um, you can put a rigid eye shield or a cup over the eye. Again, anti-emetics and pain medication. And you want uh, to hopefully not have them cough because by them coughing they can uh, increase uh, intraocular pressure. And so this, uh, they may be given anti tussives to prevent any coughing from uh, taking place. Uh, if there's an avulsion to the eye, um, or and I love the sternonucleation of the eyeball from the eye socket, um, they're, they're going to be blind. Again, it's not life-threatening unless there's uh, underlying trauma behind the eye there. But again, we want to protect the eye from further trauma. Uh, again, a protective uh, cup or other rigid uh, protective device and then uh, gauze padding. I've seen uh, this once in my career. It is pretty impressive uh, looking. Uh, retinal detachment. Uh, again, this can happen medically. Uh, people get this as they get older. But it can also happen from uh, trauma to the uh, uh, eye area. And basically, part of the retina becomes separated from the, uh, 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 the wall. And these patients are going to be uh, complaining of sensations of flashing lights. Uh, or they may be seeing uh, floaters uh, in their eyes. And they may have some vision loss. You might also see some black spots in the eye. And usually, the black spots are found in the uh, center of the visual field. Um, and like the other patients, uh, transport them sitting upright if at all possible, again, based on their injuries, don't put any pressure on the globe, and again, protect the eye uh, with rigid eye shields if possible. We've got uh, facial trauma uh, with, uh, you can have mandibular fractures, maxillary fractures, you can have dislocations. Uh, you know if somebody's got a dislocation of the jaw, they can't close their jaw. The uh, problem with that is, Try and swallow with your jaw open up. It's pretty difficult to do, so you need to make sure that you uh, manage any secretions they have uh, in there. Uh, they may have some crepitus in the area, um, swelling, uh, again, not being able to close their jaw. 
or they tell you that, you know, when I close my jaw, my teeth don't go together. That's called a malocclusion. You could have a patient that has had a fractured jaw or dislocation. They may have uh, their jaw uh, wired shut. So you want to make sure that you've got wire cutters in case they uh, would vomit because uh, we don't want them to aspirate. So you want to make sure that you've got uh, suction equipment. Uh, you may need to nasally intubate these patients. Uh, you may need to do a surgical uh, uh, airway, again, depending on your uh, protocols. Uh, Usually there's really no treatment that uh, on scene uh, for these patients. Uh, another big uh, problem with uh, facial trauma and fractures are the Ford fractures, uh, one, two, and three. Uh, Ford three is you can basically take the front of the face and pull it away uh, from the face. And so there can be some major airway problems that you just have to be aware of when we uh, manage these type of patients. Again, sitting upright if possible, having suction. Uh, dental avulsions, again, it's more of a cosmetic type thing, but if you do have the uh, tooth, um, milk uh, is, can be used. There's also something called Hank solution. Uh, saline, you really don't like to use, but uh, it can be used if it's less than an hour. So you can have uh, injuries to the larynx and trachea, uh, fairly uncommon there. Um, uh, we have to remember with this type of injury that uh, you have the airway, you've got vascular structure, and you've also got the C-spine there. And so we may need to make sure that we uh, immobilize these patients uh, because of that. And then we need to, again, monitor the airway. And they may be having a hoarse voice, uh, so that's something to pay attention to. Uh, if they are conscious, have them talk. There can be, again, lacerations, um, bruising, ecchymosis, tenderness in the area. They could have sub-Q air, because air is leaking out into the tissue. It can also have strider, which is a, uh, a scary thing to hear on our patients. Uh, this is fairly uncommon. Uh, if it does happen, it's usually in the uh, cervical trachea area. Uh, usually blunt trauma is the most common uh, injury. And this would be somebody that's gotten strangled, uh, hanging, a clothesline injury like your uh, snowmobilers that go across country and get off the trail and go and 60 miles an hour over an open field and they come to a uh, fence that they don't see and get a clothesline injury there. Uh, there again could be penetrating injuries but they're a minority of it. Uh, what you might see is you might see bubbling from a neck wound if there's penetrating there. Again, sub uh, air or emphysema. Uh, they're going to have, uh, when they talk, it's painful, dysphonia, uh, trouble breathing, again the strider, again swelling. And so you have to worry about um, uh, airway management problems with that. Uh, we need to intubate them, but again, it needs to be done very carefully because uh, of the trauma that's there. If there is an open wound, you want to make sure you put an occlusive uh, dressing over it. Again, spinal precautions, uh, transfer to the trauma center, and all the stuff that we're going to monitor on uh, any of our patients. Some patients have thyroid injuries. Um, again, fairly rare. Uh, big concern with uh, thyroid injuries, though, is um, it's very vascular, and they can have hematomas, which can uh, occlude the airway. Can also, due to uh, damage, they could go into uh, thyrotoxicosis, fancy name for thyroid storm, uh, where you have excess thyroid hormones that uh, kick in following trauma. Uh, has about a 20 to 30 percent mortality rate, and they get hypermetabolic. And they're going to be tachycardic. Oftentimes, the heart rate's greater than 140 beats a minute. Uh, they can become hyperthermic, uh, temp 103 up to 104. Uh, they can be in a coma with agitation, nausea, vomiting. Um, and they could have elevated thyroid, uh, thyroid levels. Uh, they may need to be given a beta blocker. Uh, Nesmolol drip uh, can be common. Uh, may need to be sedated because they're getting so agitated and we need to implement some cooling measures because, again, their temperature is uh, rising. Again, not real common, but it is there. Just something to be aware of. Uh, big problem, again, with neck injuries is there's, uh, uh, you got the jugular veins, you got the carotid arteries <coughs> that are uh, in that area. And so major trauma to that area, they can bleed out fairly rapidly. They can also have hematomas, which can impinge on the airway. You can get air embolism, uh, which creates its own set of problems there. 
and so direct pressure, uh, occlusive dressing. Um, some people advocate uh, putting them in Trendelenburg. If you sit them upright, air, if does, air does get in there, air rises, so it's going to go to the, um, the brain. So Trendelenburg might be a position to put them in, but you have to remember uh, that by putting them in Trendelenburg, especially larger patients, all the abdominal uh, cavity is going to be putting pressure on the thoracic cavity, which can create respiratory problems for our, uh, for our patients. Abdominal trauma, especially if it's blunt trauma, can be uh, difficult to recognize. Again, blunt can be dangerous, more dangerous than penetrating because there's nothing there to get your uh, uh, attention initially. Uh, and the abdomen's a fairly large area, even with some major bleeding, you may not be noticeable, uh, especially in uh, our patients that have large, large abdomens. So again, need to be a good, do a good assessment on them. Um, so you've got the spleen and the liver, two big organs which can have mass amounts of bleeding. Uh, you've got in the retroperitoneal area, you've got the kidneys, which can run into problems. We've got the aorta that are going through the um, uh, abdominal area, the bladder, uh, which generally is not going to kill them, but you can get uh, uh, infections if the bladder ruptures. Gallbladder, you've got uh, juices that can uh, do damage, cause peritonitis. We've got the small and large intestines um, in the stomach, and the stomach has uh, acids in it, which can leak out, again, leading to peritonitis. You've got the small and large intestines, which have E. coli and other things in there, which can uh, lead to peritonitis. The pancreas gets damaged. It's got the pancreatic juices, which can do a number on the uh, uh, organs in the abdomen. So a lot of things that we need to worry about there. Uh, it's not so much we're going to do anything different based on what organ is injured, um, in the abdominal area, retroperitoneal area. But we just need to be aware of that. Yes, in fact, they do have something that uh, is going on. So again, the biggest thing that's going to cause problems initially in uh, life threatening for our patients is a uh, large amount of bleeding, again, from the liver and the uh, spleen. Also, again, you can have the ruptured diaphragm, which can lead to the stomach intestines going up into the uh, uh, chest cavity. Uh, so we need to pay attention to the mechanism of injury. And again, they may not have any initial signs and symptoms. Uh, and there may be some signs that you might see, and uh, again, initially you're not going to see it pre-hospital, but again, on patients that you're transferring to another hospital, you uh, may see Gray Turner sign, and that's bruising in the flanks. Uh, so retroperitoneal uh, kidneys. Uh, or Cullen sign, and that's bruising around the umbilicus, uh, the belly button. And we've got our blunt trauma there, we've got our penetrating trauma, and again, we need to do a good assessment and monitor them until we do get them to the hospital. Um, and just like anything, anything can cause holes in the uh, uh, abdominal area, knives, guns, tree limbs, metal rods, there's some cool pictures on the internet with uh, tree limbs and metal rods sticking in people in different areas. So again, we need to be really suspicious of uh, abdominal injuries, especially the blunt, and just be uh, good clinicians and do good assessments. And so we're inspecting, we're auscultating, and we're uh, palpating. Uh, and again, primary assessment, um, if we're transporting, and all our patients that we're transporting from a hospital we need to do our primary assessment at the bedside and maybe even a secondary uh, assessment and then continue to monitor on the way that we get there. These are the signs symptoms that we may see. We may not. Again, it depends on their injuries and how, where they are and when we get to them. Uh, again, oxygen, IV fluids if needed, at least two large bore IVs. Um, the patients may have a central line in that the doctor put in before we got there, uh, monitor their vital signs again, and we may need to bolus them with uh, crystalloids and or blood, depending on what uh, their mean arterial pressure is, their blood pressure, and their CVP, and again, monitor the airway. Oh, they may have uh, uh, bladder injuries, urethral injuries. And so they may have a Foley catheter in. If they have urethral injury, uh, they're not going to put a Foley catheter in because you don't want, you have no idea where that Foley catheter is going to go. So they will also, they'll always look, they'll look for blood at the meatus, the head of the penis. Uh, they'll also do a check for the prostate. Uh, the prostate's about the size of a walnut. It should be firm. Um, and if they can't feel it, it feels boggy, then they want to be real suspicious that they get a urethral injury there. 
like any of our trauma patients, you want to keep them warm. If they have an open uh, abdominal wound, um, you want to make sure that it's covered with an occlusive dressing, uh, and then uh, uh, a sterile dressing and an occlusive dressing over that to prevent the loss of uh, heat. If it's evisceration, we want to put uh, a moist dressing over uh, so it doesn't stick to the, uh, uh, the organs when they want to take it off. And I already talked about the hollow and solid organs, so the solid organs are going to be the ones that are bleeding. Um, and then the hollow organs are the ones that have stuff that leaks out, which leads to uh, peritonitis. So generally early on, the hollow organs that are bleeding are going to be uh, leading our patients to shock. And so again, the breast, the biggest concern initially in the care of our patient of the liver or spleen, because again, they're going to be uh, uh, bleeding out. Cursign is a sign that's often found uh, with a spleen injury. It's pain in the shoulder. It's a referred pain. And um, again, with the liver, you can also have that. Uh, again, our treatment is um, to monitor them, to be aware that they do have an abdominal organ and, uh, injury and just monitor for that. Um, many times they won't need to take the patients to surgery, they'll manage it medically. Uh, so rushing to surgery isn't the first thing, but again, it depends on what's going on with the patient. Generally with a lot of bleeding and farther down the road with peritonitis, uh, you will get abdominal uh, uh, swelling. We're looking for distension, rid rigidity, tenderness. Uh, I also want to remember that they may have a tendency to vomit, so you may need to put an OG or an NG in. And the biggest thing, again, for us as a high index is a suspicion. Again, these are things that are going to be leaking stuff out. And again, short term, uh, we're they're not going to see uh, much from this, it's longer term while they're in the hospital. But again, if you're transferring a patient <laughs> from one hospital to the next, you may be seeing the after effects of these uh, hollow organs uh, with the peritonitis. Also have to remember that there's uh, vascular uh, injuries that take place. Again, the aorta, inferior vena cava. Our kidneys have uh, major organs in there. There's mesenteric arteries, iliac arteries, and it's just like any uh, vascular injury. I uh, have to worry about um, hypotension, bleeding out, hypolemic shock. And so standard stuff, we're going to be monitoring them, airway, vital signs, things like that. You may need to uh, man manage your airway with uh, intubation uh, and fluid resuscitation. Um, monitor their blood pressure. Um, 80, maybe 90 is good, permissive hypotension. Uh, crystalloids, uh, blood, if the crystalloids aren't managing it. And then if they are bleeding out, they definitely do need to go to surgery. Pelvis, um, a person can lose a lot of blood uh, from their, their pelvis, uh, especially a thing called an open book fracture. It's just like a book if you open it up. That's kind of what uh, the x-ray looks like. Uh, MVCs, falls, pedestrians struck by vehicles. Uh, if, you, if your pelvis, pelvis is fractured, it's taken a lot of force, and so you always want to look for other injuries. Uh, the pelvis, again, has a rich blood supply because of the arteries that go through there, and so they can lose uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of blood in there. So if you've got a pelvic fracture, anytime you palpate, you don't want to palpate real strong uh, because you don't want to um, take that bone wherever it is and lacerate a vessel that hasn't been lacerated yet so that we can create a secondary injury. So gently uh, palpate, um, ro gently rotate, look for uneven uh, height of the iliac crest, or maybe the legs are uneven in length. Uh, they will be having tenderness upon palpation, again, when you're doing it gently. Uh, crepitus, uh, when you move them, you've got to be careful. You don't want to log roll these patients because it's going to, again, put uh, pressure on the, uh, the pelvis there. So you need to splint it. Um, you, again, depending on what's going on, you can use the, uh, the long backboard as a splint pre-hospital. Uh, but there's also things like pelvic binders that you can put on. Uh, if you don't have a pelvic binder, you can use a, a, a long sheet and wrap that around. It's, uh, again, used for splinting the patient. Any of those things uh, uh, can work. Treat the patient for shock. Uh, if there's any soft tissue uh, damage, uh, manage that. Uh, scoop stretcher is good for picking these patients up. Again, we don't want to roll them onto one side. Extremity 
trauma. Uh, the life threats from extremity trauma are generally the, the femurs. Uh, generally, most extremity uh, injuries are not life threatening, but they do have morbidity where they can have nerve and uh, vessel damage, uh, have amputations, but again, not life uh, threatening. So we got sprains, strains, fractures, dislocations, contusions. Uh, big concern is compartment and crushing syn uh, syndromes, which we'll talk about in just a minute. A minute. Uh, so a big thing is uh, CNS uh, assessment, uh, splint properly, pain medication. And when it talks about the six Ps, that's what we're looking for in any extremity trauma or CMS. But if somebody's got compartment syndrome, uh, this is what uh, we're assessing. Pain, when you're talking about compartment syndrome, is pain out of, uh, when you look at it, it doesn't look bad, but it's pain that's horrible. Uh, touching and moving, it's horrible. They're going to be pale. Pulselessness is generally a late sign. Uh, paresthesia, they got a funny feeling in the extremity. That extremity might be uh, uh, paralyzed, and they're complaining of uh, uh, pressure. Uh, so the big thing is, again, it's an extremity injury, splinting it properly, uh, pain medications again, and managing uh, uh, and watching for the six Ps. You have open fractures, you have closed fractures. Anytime you've got an open wound over an extremity, uh, you want to be uh, cognizant of the fact that there could be a fracture under there. Um, fractures, you have to worry about blood loss. Again, patients lose lots of uh, blood in the femurs. Um, these are the signs and symptoms that uh, we're looking for and we're assessing. And these are how we're managing our patients that have the, uh, uh, in this case, the isolated extremity fracture. Uh, crepitus can also be uh, found in uh, these things. If they're bleeding out heavily from an amputation or major wound on the extremities, uh, tourniquets uh, should be used. Direct pressure is the first thing you want to do, but if that's not working, then apply a tourniquet. Uh, tourniquets have been found to be life-threatening, which has been, uh, came out of the uh, Afghanistan and Iraq war. Uh, any open wounds, you want to have, make sure you've got uh, sterile dressings. IV fluids, again, the amount of fluids you're going to be giving depends on uh, what their vital signs are in their clinical situation. Uh, analgesia of some kind, extremity fractures, uh, dislocations can be very painful. Uh, splint them in the uh, normal anatomical position. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, you do that, check CMS before you do it and after. Uh, if you don't have a pulse after you splint it, you need to uh, reassess that and re-splint them. Uh, again, oxygenation, vital signs, monitor. Uh, if you've got femur fractures, there's different types of uh, traction splints out there. The Hare, Sager, and uh, Kendrick, which are using our femur fracture here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large bone, a lot of muscle spasm, and it's amazing how uh, much relief patients can get from uh, putting them in one of these uh, traction splints. Uh, contraindications, though, of course, to them is if the patient has a hip or pelvic fracture, knee injury or ankle uh, injury, dislocations or fractures. Uh, basically, they're used for midline uh, femur fractures there. Uh, and it can, again, make the patient feel a lot better. Uh, when we think of uh, spine immobilization, we all zero in on the cervical spine, but we need to remember that any part of the spine uh, from the uh, sacral area up to the C-spine can be damaged. Uh, usually the lumbar and the uh, uh, sacrum uh, are not going to be life-threatening. It's when you get higher up, and especially the uh, C-spine. And we classify spinal injuries as either stable or unstable, and it's basically based on the mechanism. And if you have flexion injuries, you've got flexion with rotation, you have extension, extension injuries, you've got compression fractures, you have uh, dislocati dislocations that can go along with this. Um, and so you really need to look at the mechanism, can give us some idea of what uh, uh, injury that they may have. Uh, there's primary injuries, and that's the injury that happens in the initial, um, whatever happened, they run into a, a tree at 60 miles an hour, they've fallen from a great distance, uh, they dove into a swimming pool with six inches of water. And so the mechanism is important in our assessment in de uh, deciding on uh, possible uh, injuries that there. You can also have secondary injuries. We can create it by not immobilizing them properly, or it can come about because they're getting hypoxic because of uh, uh, 
damage to the uh, vessels and uh, tissue around the spine. There can be swelling uh, that takes place. Uh, they can be hypotensive, uh, and that's uh, going to impact the amount of blood flow going to the, uh, uh, that area. Uh, they can have lacerations, so blood isn't going to the, uh, that area also. Uh, hyperthermia uh, can create a problem for our vertebral fractures. Uh, and then, uh, again, the biggest one, something that we can do something about, is uh, making sure we immobilize them properly, that we don't, uh, don't mishandle them. Uh, and then hypoxia, oxygenate them. Um, if they're having problems with their uh, blood pressure and that, make sure we've got uh, fluid that's going on there uh, to maintain the blood pressure. So the most devastating fracture is going to be the cervical fracture. Uh, but any fracture can be devastating for the patient itself, but cervical fractures early on can be uh, life-threatening. Uh, the higher up, the more uh, difficulty the patient's going to be having. Farther down the road, uh, the higher up fractures are going to be having problems with uh, breathing. Uh, so we need to make sure that we monitor respiratory status, uh, monitor the cardiovascular uh, status. Uh, and somebody can uh, have a broken neck, but the fracture of the vertebra hasn't impinged on the cord itself, and then we immobilize them improperly, and now we remove them wrong, and now that fractured vertebra has now entered the uh, cord and done damage to the cord, so we need to make sh very sure that we uh, manage that properly. Uh, one of the things you'll see in somebody that's having respiratory compromise because of a cervical uh, injury is they uh, will have belly breathing, um, or diaphragmatic breathing, where their uh, chest uh, muscles aren't uh, working real well and they're, they're using their diaphragm to breathe. Uh, belly breathing is normal on little kids. It's not normal on adults. So that can, again, be a clue that they've got some cord injury there. Uh, thoracic fractures, um, again, can lead to problems with intercostal muscles, also uh, leading to respiratory uh, difficulty. Uh, Spinal shock is rare, but it does happen, and so that's a patient who is uh, hypotensive, uh, and they also have a, a low normal to a low pulse, uh, and skin can be uh, warm and dry, unlike other shocks where they're, if they're hypotensive, they're uh, tachycardic. So spinal shock uh, is, again, a low blood pressure with a low normal or a, uh, a, a low pulse, uh, 50s, 60s. Uh, so they uh, aren't compensating because the messages aren't able to get through to cause vasoconstriction uh, and cause the heart rate to uh, go up. Uh, these patients often do well. It's often a temporary thing. Lumbar fractures, uh, again, generally not life-threatening. Uh, uh, common in somebody that's wearing a lap belt and not a shoulder strap and gets in a rapid deceleration injury and they jackknife over. Uh, that's the most common thing you're going to see that in. Again, immobilization. Humerus, they can lose a uh, uh, pretty good amount of blood. Again, generally not life-threatening unless it's an amputation or actively bleeding. And again, in any fractures, CMS, sensation, uh, pulse, circulation, and uh, movement. Some people will use a marker to mark pulses because they can be hard to find, but immobilization on any of the extremity fractures and CMS. Rib fractures, um, usually one rib fracture is not the life-threatening, sometimes not even two, and it depends on how bad the fractures are. Uh, but they can lead to uh, flail segments, can lead to pneumothorax. There's also vessels in there that can be torn, so they can have uh, hemothorax and significant uh, um, uh, bleeding into the chest cavity. Nasal fractures, uh, biggest concern is, is it impacting the airway. So we just need to monitor that and watch for, uh, uh, we need to uh, do some suctioning there. There can be dislocations, uh, especially in the joint area. It's not life-threatening, but it can be limb-threatening. So we need to monitor the CMS. Uh, going to be having pain, there could be swelling. Uh, it's going to look abnormal. And one way you can tell if it's abnormal or not is look at the other, other extremity, and that's with any fractures. They're not able to move their uh, extremity. Uh, we're going to be seeing that. So oxygen, airway, fluids, again, CMS, uh, splinted in the position of comfort um, while maintaining circulation. So you may, may be able to manipulate it. 
if there is no pulse there, and then just monitor the pulse uh, motor and uh, sensation on a regular basis. Any of these fractures may need uh, analgesic medication for pain relief, or they may need uh, IV fluids uh, for blood pressure. These are just some uh, terms. Subluxation is another uh, term for uh, uh, dislocation, um, but can also go from a sprain. Uh, dislocation, there have been some uh, subluxations where it's pretty impressive if you look on the C spine, where it's an obvious deformity where it doesn't go down nice and smooth. If you look at the x ray, it's pushed backwards. Uh, so, different uh, grades of subluxation. Uh, and again, careful C spine immobilization on those patients. Watch their respiratory status and their uh, cardiovascular status. Amputations, again, can be life threatening. Uh, direct pressures, the initial thing you're going to do with uh, these patients, uh, if need be, and or a tourniquet, depending on what's uh, going, how bad the lap uh, amputation is. Um, some are life threatening, others are not. Again, if it's arm, leg, can be life threatening. If it's a digit, it's certainly not life threatening. Generally, you want to bring the part with because they may be able to uh, reattach it. Uh, you want to keep it cool. Don't uh, wet it down, though, because that'll damage the tissue. Ice, um, moist dressings on the part, uh, Ziploc bag, if you've got uh, those, that you can put it in there and place it on ice. Uh, tourniquet, make sure you know what time you put it on. They're going to want to know that in the. Uh, uh, in the hospital. So if there's a dislocation, assume that there's a fracture involved. And again, being able to look at x-rays and understanding x-rays, that can help in the uh, uh, care of the patient and uh, an idea of what might be going on. Uh, so we definitely want to splint. Uh, cast may have been placed, uh, but generally not uh, if these patients were new to the emergency department, but they may be in the ICU and have some casts on, you just need to make sure that they don't develop a compartment syndrome because there could be swelling underneath the cast, and that's putting pressure on the uh, compartments and the, the muscles. And so you need to make sure that you monitor uh, CMS uh, below the injury. So here's compartment syndrome, uh, and, and these are the things that can cause it. A lot of times uh, it's maybe in somebody that uh, uh, grandpa hasn't been heard from in a few days, somebody goes over and there's grandpa laying on uh, his side, on his arm uh, or leg, and the pressure from that uh, causes compartment syndrome to take place. Fluid is able to enter the compartments, but it can't lead, and so pressure starts building up. And um, then circulation gets impaired, and uh, function uh, also gets impaired, and uh, the extremity can be lost. So any uh, extremity can have this happen on, but the forearms and the legs are the most common. Uh, and this takes a while for this to develop. It's not going to happen rapidly. So again, we already mentioned pain out of proportion to what the injury looks like. This is excruciating pain. Just touching it, just moving a little bit, uh, patients might scream out in pain. Again, pale, pulselessness, again, that's a late sign. Paresthesia is a funny feeling. Paralysis of that uh, limb, uh, extreme amount of pressure. And there's a thing called poikilothermia, and that's the extremity it may also be cold because, again, you're not getting the good circulation there. So just, again, monitor CMS, airway, vital signs. Um, elevate the extremity above the heart, if possible, uh, to limit the amount of uh, fluids that are going to that area. In the uh, hospital, they'll have the uh, physician come in, and they can actually measure the, the pressure in the compartments. And depending on what the pressure is, they will uh, either observe them or they will uh, take them to surgery. Um, you may need to uh, remove any splinting material or loosen it. Uh, pain medication is real helpful for these patients if their vital signs will uh, handle it. Uh, IV fluids, you want to uh, keep the kidneys working because they can have uh, uh, myoglobin that's released. They go into rhabdomyolysis so the kidneys can shut down. Uh, potassium will get released, and so they have hyperkalemia that takes place. So again, these are the uh, uh, things that uh, might also be released is the calcium and sodium besides the potassium and the uh, myoglobin. Um, and this is known as a smiling death, quote unquote. Uh, this might be a patient that, again, was uh, trapped for quite a while, was finally extricated, and they're happy because they're out, 
and then all of a sudden the potassium gets released because they now get released and then they aren't so happy anymore and they're decompensating and going downhill. Um, so again, motor weakness, uh, they're going to have some signs of trauma or compression. Again, the sensory loss, uh, if they've been uh, trapped for quite a while, dehydration from the rhabdomyolysis and the myoglobin. If you look at their urine, it's going to be dark or tea colored. And so they need to have fluids uh, going to basically flush the kidneys. Um, and again, they're going to have hyperkalemia, they're going to have hypocalcemia, again, from the electrolyte imbalances that are taking place. So they're going to need a lot of fluids, and there's formulas that the physicians will use. Uh, may need sodium bicarb because of the uh, waste products, the as acid, they're getting acidotic. Need to make sure you monitor their uh, uh, ECG, the heart monitor, uh, because they can have um, high potassium. Uh, and with high potassium, you see peaked uh, T waves on the ECG, so they may need calcium. Uh, they're going to have a Foley catheter in because they want to monitor their uh, urine output. They want to have at least 200 to 300 mLs an hour. Normally, we're happy with 30 mLs an hour on adults. Uh, they're going to be giving bicarb. They want to keep the pH of the urine uh, above 6.5. Uh, so they'll be having a uh, sodium bicarb drip. Uh, they may be given mannitol because, again, they want to um, have the fluid uh, leaving. And so you want to make sure you monitor the electrolytes. And uh, again, they may need uh, analgesia uh, for the pain and benzos to help uh, relax the muscles because the muscles can uh, go into spasm. So all standard stuff for managing the extremity splinting. Casting, again, casts they're not going to put on because uh, they want the swelling to go down, but again, it might be a patient in the hospital that's been there for a while. You just need to manage, manage, uh, monitor the CMS there. Uh, may need to uh, reduce and realign, so that's traction splints, uh, maybe femur fractures, or if there's dislocations, they may need to be doing that. They need to make sure that we know what we're doing, do that. Uh, they may have external fixators on, internal fixators. Uh, and you just need to be aware of those type of things. Uh, how to manage them, and basically you're not doing anything for them just other than the fact that uh, they do have the fixator and you just want to be careful when you're moving them. Number of drugs that they might uh, be given. So the uh, anti-inflammatory drugs uh, to control pain and reduce inflammation. Opiates, that's the uh, sort of the mainstay of pain control. And again, we just need to monitor respiratory depression, hypotension, <coughs> and nausea and vomiting if you give a narcotic opiate too fast, besides the respiratory rate dropping and then getting hypotensive, they uh, get, can get real nauseous and then vomit, and then you've got an airway problem that um, you're concerned about, so have suction ready. Fentanyl is a fairly common drug given for trauma patients. Uh, unlike morphine, it has less effect on the uh, respiratory drive and um, hypotension, so it's safer to give. Antibiotics uh, may be given. Uh, with major trauma patients or if there's open, open wounds, open fractures, things like that. And they, they're started early on during the resuscitation phase in the uh, hospital. And if you're on antibiotics, you just need to make sure that you monitor for any signs of an allergic reaction. Uh, they may be given muscle relaxants to uh, release the spasms if it's uh, extremity uh, fractures because uh, the muscles will go in uh, spasm. Um, a lot of our patients are on uh, anticoagulants. Uh, patients may be taking aspirin every day on a regular basis, or they're on uh, uh, Coumadin. And so that uh, puts a stress on their body that they may be bleeding um, or be at risk for bleeding because of the anticoagulations uh, uh, there. Um, so the patient, and our trauma patients will have underlying medical problems. So maybe a, our patient uh, has some deep vein thrombosis. So they're in the hospital and getting heparin. Uh, and again, heparin will uh, uh, affect clotting and whatnot. And so they may be more at risk for bleeding. Or the patients may be having uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, and they may be on uh, anticoagulants uh, for that. And then sedative hypnotics, uh, again, Try and relax our patient, make them less anxious, make them less agitated. Uh, can have uh, benzos, uh, lorazepam, uh, Valium, Ativan. Uh, can also have uh, sedatives, propofol, to keep them sedated, uh, which is a nice thing, especially when you're transporting them to a hospital on a helicopter or a, uh, an ambulance.
big thing to remember with uh, older patients is that they generally have underlying medical problems. They're on medications that can affect their vital signs. So a lot of elderly people are on beta blockers. Uh, keeps the heart rate low, keeps the blood pressure low. So it can have an impact on uh, what we're going to see on their vital signs. Uh, they could have pacemakers. Uh, kyphosis, their spines are uh, in strange shapes. Uh, so they don't lay on the backboard uh, like a younger person will with a, a normal spine. And so we've got to think about padding. Uh, they may have dentures uh, or dental devices in them. So that's an airway, uh, uh, could be an airway problem. Uh, they get nosebleeds easier, um, especially in the fall and winter when it's uh, drier out. And plus, they might be on some type of blood thinner. Again, with these underlying medical conditions, they're OK before the trauma, but now they've got the trauma. That's just one more brick put on them that can put them over the edge. So we just need to be aware of that. They're more at risk for not doing as well uh, as our uh, younger patients there. And they may take longer to respond to any of the uh, uh, things that we do for them. So we just need to be aware of that. Uh, their temperature regulating mechanism isn't as good, just like real little kids. So maintain their temperature uh, as best as possible. Splinting is really important, especially on transports, uh, uh, long distance transports. Uh, they get hypothermic easier too because they don't have the subcutaneous uh, fat. So again, the big thing is just be aware of your elderly patients because they tend not to do as well as the younger patients and we need to be uh, really astute clinicians. Our pregnant uh, patients, so you've got actually two patients. And the best thing we can do to take care of the baby is take care of the mother. Because if the mother is in critical uh, condition, if the mother is dying, uh, the mother is going to take everything that she has and try and keep herself alive. And the kid's going to be, child's going to be put at uh, risk. So again, two patients that were going on there. The mother has a large blood volume uh, in pregnancy, again, because you have the baby there. And so they can lose a lot of their blood, up to 30%, before they show any signs of uh, shock. So just be careful uh, about that. Uh, moms in the third trimester, you do not like to have them flat on their back because they, they can get supine hypotensive syndrome. Uh, and that's because you've got this baby, think of it as a bowling ball, pushing down on the vena cava so they have less uh, preload coming back to the heart. So you're getting hypotensive and tachycardic. So you always want to put your pregnant females in their third trimester, uh, tilt to the left. So you can tilt the backboard to the left. Uh, the big thing that you can see in our uh, pregnant trauma patients, uh, car crashes, falls, is uh, abruptial placenta, uh, where the placenta gets torn away from the uh, uh, uterus. Uh, and you can see here a big uh, uh, mortality uh, if this happens in our uh, blunt trauma patients for the fetus. So you may or may not see bleeding. Uh, it's going to be a darker red. Uh, going to be have abdominal pain. A lot of times it's a ripping, tearing pain. They'll be complaining of back pain. Uh, the um, uterus is uh, tender. Uh, they can be showing signs of shock, hypotension, tachycardia. Um, if uh, you carry a, a Doppler or they've got a Doppler in the uh, hospital, they'll be listening for fetal heart tones. They may uh, not have any fetal heart tones. Uh, you can ask the uh, mother, uh, are you feeling the baby move? If you do not feel the baby moving, that's a, a concerning sign for us. And so again, the big, big thing with the uh, again, third trimester, make sure they're on their left side, if at all possible. Uh, and two large bore IVs, oxygenation, uh, doing this good assessment and treating the injuries that you find. Uh, what's going on with the mom, what you find, you treat that. Uh, and that, uh, that's the best thing you can do for the, uh, the baby. Generally, really severe patients, and this uh, has to do with distance. Uh, so it's not necessarily true that uh, your severe trauma patients are all going to be transported by air. If you're in a large urban area, close to a major hospital, you're going to go by ground. But more longer distance, if it takes you longer to go to the hospital, you're going to uh, go by air. Um, and then the risk-benefit ratio, yeah, they should go by air, but it's going to take the, uh, the helicopter longer to get here, and I can get them to the hospital sooner. So that needs to come into your, your thought process, which way do we want to go on the, uh, on the uh, transfer of this patient. Uh, helicopters can carry some more advanced uh, uh, gear. They uh, will carry blood and things like that. So again, you're weighing the cost-benefit uh, ratio. 
So that is it for trauma.